Well, no, I was thinking on the way over here. You know what we should do? What should we do? Dude, we should do a fishing podcast. <laughs> Is that what you're thinking we yeah. should do? You think we should do a fishing? I don't know, man. I don't think anybody would actually listen to it. Maybe like 10 people? Five? I mean, do you I, know five people? I, yeah, but I get bored on a Tuesday sometimes. <laughs> I look for stuff to yeah. kind of bring in. Just a typical Tuesday. I mean, you know, if you want to give it a try, we can just go ahead and do it. Let's just do it. I mean, Take we it. don't know what we're talking about. We go don't ahead. fish. You, like you that. started off off All right, so welcome to the uh, Fish Life Podcast. That's what we're going to call it. That's what we're going to call it. Yeah, yeah. that's it. <laughs> so, um, my left, your right. Your late Fort Guy, Billy Lawson. That's right. My right, your left, Chris Blackman. And we got a guest in the house tonight. We've got my good buddy, Mr. Anthony. He's actually, ironically, he's my next door neighbor. So Just a neighbor. Just a neighbor. What's funny is they've seen another neighbor that used to live next door, Austin Fowler, a.k.a. Jordan Lee. Jordan Lee. His doppelganger, anyway, used to live <laughs> next door to me. Austin moved out. We upgraded, and we got a Marine. Andy, some of y'all know that I was in the Marine Corps. Anthony was in the Marine Corps as well. And the big deal tonight is we're going to talk about our stuff. We're going to talk about current fishing conditions. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about what's been going on in turn- tournament worlds. Uh, Jacob Wheeler just dominating. Again. Uh, we're going to get into your recent tournament experiences. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk plenty of fishing tonight. But those of you that follow the channel know what we got going on. We, hey, this is the week. It's this week, the end of this week. You guys can come register on Friday. We got our tournament uh, Saturday, July 4th. It's an open team tournament, $100 entry, and it's going to be benefiting 22 Kill. Great military winning nonprofit. Uh, it's going to be a hundred dollar entry, seventy percent payback, so you'll have a chance to win some money. Thirty percent is going straight to twenty two kill. We've got great auction items. We've got a whiskey Myers signed guitar by the signed by the entire band. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a bunch of like uh, Yeti RTS like big fancy high dollar coolers. We got fishing gear. I think there's some apparel coming. Like we've got all kinds of good auction items for you guys to hopefully get a good deal. So you can take a swing and get a good deal on something. Or maybe you'll get a really bad deal and donate a whole bunch of money to 22 Kill, which would be even better because that's the whole purpose mm-hmm. of this deal is we're going to come together and do what we love and enjoy fishing and enjoy the outdoors and here in East Texas. Uh, we're going to hang out. A lot of us for the first time that are watching this channel, some of you guys are going to come, come down here for the first time and hang out with us, and that's going to be fun. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're doing something that's a, a very uh, near and dear cause to all of our hearts. Uh, we are all very much american patriots and love our country and are very appreciative of the guys that go out every day and deal with the bad stuff so that the rest of us can live our lives the way we live them right that's right yeah so that's the deal this is we we need to support those guys any way we can and those guys go through so much that there's times when they really struggle and that's where 22 kill comes in they they really help these guys transition into normal life transition and deal with some of the issues that they uh they acquire doing what they have to do to protect others which is you know just that's god's work if we're being honest right right. like that's god's work god says to love others and serve others above yourself and uh, there's no finer example of that than the men and women that go out and risk their lives to protect us so it's important that we do what we got to do for them so anthony man hey thank you so much for coming over here and joining us this is anthony's first time on a recorded camera or anything so he's nervous he told you nervous just a little bit it's just a camera on the wall Mm -hmm. like there's nobody behind that camera nobody (laughs) on but no man we're we're just gonna relax and talk about it uh and you've been my neighbor you know i'm busy a lot and we've you know hung out a couple times we've talked a little marine corps stuff a little bit but i really don't know much about your experience uh in the service so man tell us you know how how do you How'd you come around to volunteer for Marine What was it that made you join the Marine Corps? Uh, I just had an interest in it from really just a young age. I think my cousin and my uncle, you know, they were both Marines. I looked up to them quite a bit. And so I had them, you know, kind of as motivation. They were both really hardworking dudes. And I just kind of saw that work ethic and the, yeah. the tenacity that it seems like the Marine Corps reason people. So, um, yeah, it's funny you, know. you say that. I had, we had a, he was, you know, the reason that I joined the Marine Corps, uh, maybe not the sole reason why I joined but the reason why I knew I was going to be a Marine over any other branch if I did join was we had a family friend that I literally thought was my uncle most of my childhood. He yeah. was just so close to the family. Um, a man named Billy Meeks that was a Marine in the Vietnam era. And, and I saw him do some things in my life growing up. He literally saved my grandparents' life one time in a flood. And, and he – tell we'll, we'll chase a squirrel. We chase a squirrel. 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 <laughs> squirrel. Here we go. So there was a, a really bad flood when my grandparents lived down in Spring, Texas when I was a kid. It was in 1994. And the water had gotten up over the power lines, and my grandparents were trapped on their roof. They had to, and they had to get up on their roof as yeah. the water kept rising. It had never flooded like this. It had flooded there before they lived close to a, a river, but it had never flooded like this. Um, and so they were literally stuck on their house, and water had got so high it was up above some of the power lines. And so the fire department, all the first responders, they wouldn't take their metal John boats down into the water and go get them because the power lines were in right, the water. Right, exactly. 
And I remember he took their boat and he got in it himself and went and got my grandparents and came back. And that was the day when I saw him do that, I said, if I ever decide to do something like this, police, fire department, military, I want to do what he does. I want, and I want to be in the Marine Corps because, I, you know, that was the deal. I saw his example. And, and that's the, the deal with the Marine Corps in, in all branches. You know, you see fine examples of people that were molded by that. And it created this man that's a man that you admire for some reason. Uh, and it makes you want to follow in their footsteps. So that's great. So so you joined the Marine Corps. And tell us about your time. Tell me a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your time in the Marine Corps. I know you got deployed to Afghanistan. Yep. I was deployed to Afghanistan in Jordan. Um, it was uh, kind of a weird situation when we were there. It was a lot of fob watching. Um, we didn't really do many patrols uh, that weren't mounted anyway. We did we did mounted uh, operations a lot, but there was uh, it was really kinetic, but they weren't really kinetic towards us. They kind of knew better at that point. Yeah. You know, if they messed with us, they were going to. What get time it, frame so. were you in Afghanistan? What year was that? Uh, I was twelve to sixteen. So, okay. And cool. I was in uh, I was in three seven in twenty nine Palms, California, and uh, I had a, a pretty hardcore uh, pretty hardcore CEO. He was a Marslock dude, and so we got you know outstanding training really. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't really have any casualties. A lot of that was just kind of the situation we were in, and then a lot of it was, I think, the training, you know, too. Right. So. Marines are pretty good at what they do. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. one thing. We as Marines, we, we might come across a little cocky and arrogant, but the deal is the Marines do, as a whole entire branch of the military, I believe the Marine Corps does the best job of training everybody in the branch of the Marine Corps for what we do, which is close with and destroy the end, right? That's yes, what we do. And so... When the Marine Corps gets there, you can always tell the difference between the Marine Corps and other branches because the Marines are just more efficient. Now, we might screw some stuff up along the way. We're kind of known to tear some <laughs> stuff down, tear some stuff up. Yeah. But the Marines are going to be super efficient and, and, and super aggressive. And, you know, that, that mentality of, of close with and destroy the enemy at all costs, when you take and you go into a combat zone and you get into a situation – and your immediate reaction is to close with and destroy the enemy. The speed at which we do that in the Marine Corps, I think, overwhelms our enemy so many times. They aren't ready for the speed and intensity that we're going to move at them with. No, yeah, it's a shock factor for sure. Yeah, and, and it gets them more like, oh, oh, wait, we, we can't do that. And they, and they bail. You know, if they can, they bail. Um, and so it's just the Marine Corps is awesome. It's the, you know, it's the fighting fight. It's force on earth. It is what it is. It's the smallest branch in the U.S. military, but the Marine Corps is the branch that everybody feels safer when they're with Marines. Even the other military branch guys. There's Army guys, uh, Air Force guys, Navy guys. They all feel better when they've got Marines on their own. That's, I've heard a million of them say it. You know, So uh, Marine Corps is great at that. So you guys went over there, had a successful deployment, uh, did what you had to do, protected, protected some things, and served, served your purpose, and uh, got the heck back home. Now, the one thing that I really wanted to kind of dive in with you on tonight uh, wasn't necessarily combat experiences or whatever mm -hmm. your personal experiences were, but every Marine, whatever their level of combat experience was, and, and even Marines that maybe didn't get deployed, which is really rare these days, hardly any Marines that don't get deployed to a combat situation these days. Um, the mentality and the training and the lifestyle that you are, are forced into when you volunteer for the Marine Corps. No, it's culture shock for sure. Um, it, it changes your mental outlook on everything. Um, and when you get out, in a few ep episodes ago, I talked about my experience when I got in adjusting. When you get out, there's a major adjustment, major adjustment. Uh, there's a lot of guys that struggle to find a purpose with their life after the military. Uh, you know, a lot of guys, unfortunately, see some stuff that they just can't let go of. Uh, that's part of it. Maybe, you know, some of us lose some people. And that's something we can't let go of. Why was it, you know, survivor's guilt, right? Why, why couldn't I be the one? Why did it have to happen to him? Why did it have to happen to my brother, my best friend? You know, uh, there's all sorts of things that can make the adjustment difficult. But in no matter what your experience was, I don't know anybody that doesn't struggle to some extent to readjust and, and realign themselves in society when they get discharged from the military. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do. It's a... Uh I mean, I don't know, I dealt with a lot when I got out because, um, well, when I was in Afghanistan, I actually got sent home about a month early on emergency leave. My father actually passed away while I was in Afghanistan, oh, so I came home yeah, about a month early for that. And so it was like weird kind of being in limbo, leaving your unit behind, and then like no one there is still there, and like yes. kind of wondering what's going on. You, you can't really talk to them, you know, so um, 
it, it was it was pretty weird being back in the rear and then like you know everybody's treating you pretty nicely because they kind of understand your situation which is also very rare in the Marine Corps you know right um, <laughs> right but but yeah it was hard man because um, really my saving grace was um, I had happened to get my CDL uh, right before I got out uh, I basically took my terminal leave and used that time to get my CDL and I kind of did it as like a fallback because I was thinking, like, you know, this is just an emergency thing in my wallet. I can go show it to somebody, and I can get me a job anywhere. Get a gig, you know? right, yeah. So, turns out, um, I'm still truck driving today. <laughs> so, you know, without that, I mean, God knows what I'd be doing. I'd probably be right. ranch handing or something, you know. So, um, at least I have something stable that gets me home every day with a good income. But, I mean, i got to be honest, man. Without that, yeah. you know, what, what would I have, you know. So, um, and then on top of that also... Um, the reason I agreed to do this, I really don't like being on camera or anything, but uh, I actually tried to off myself um, shortly after I got out. My, my wife and my my son had kind of left me and everything, so uh, just, just give me a second. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it wasn't really, it had nothing to do with combat or anything like that. It was just, uh, we, we had been struggling, you know, with our marriage, and uh, we got into a pretty big fight, and I ended up, like, throwing the Xbox against, like, the, the wall or the ground or whatever and broke that. Because she was, you know, griping about me being on it, and I was spending too much time on it, and I was, you know. Um, but I went to the gym that day and came back, and I haven't seen my son since, and I'm still fighting, like, you know, this whole battle. Um, you know, praise God, I have a family now, um, a good woman and, and a daughter, and so I'm trying to, you know, slowly figure out how to, you know, get back uh, some kind of relationship with my son. But, um, you know, I, I praise God every day that I was not successful, you know, with my suicide attempt, because... Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have any of that now, you know, and it's been nothing but a blessing ever since, you know. It took me getting back into church and getting right with God to get all this stuff, you know, kind of squared away because it was just, uh, I was looking at, you know, a lot of debt and, you know, self-inflicted wounds that yeah. eventually just kind of catch up to you. So. so I asked you to do this, and I had no idea. I did not know any of this. This yeah. is all, I mean, as we're, me and Chris are sitting here finding this out for the first time along with the people that are listening, and... Um, I had no clue, man. So that is uh, that's a lot to take in for me and, and the listeners. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, first of all, we're all very glad, right? Because the deal is, everybody that watches and follows our channel, <laughs> they're pretty patriotic, usually pretty conservative, or they probably don't stay around here very long on this right. on this channel. Um, every one of us, we see somebody that served. And we think of them with the highest honor, and we're so appreciative. Of it. And we value them, you know. Not that one person is more important than the other, but we do. We value those people a little bit more than we are the normal person that we meet in our day to day life. And so, the last thing we want to have to happen to someone that we value and value that highly is for them to their life to get cut short in any way. Uh, you know, if it's while you're serving, we don't want that obviously either. Uh, if it, you know, if you go to combat and you die, we we all know this. We all had to process this thing in our head at some point when we're getting ready to go on deployment because there's a big fear of the unknown factor. And you have to kind of, okay, well, listen, if the worst happens, I'm doing what I want to do. It's on my terms. I'm going and I'm going to fight and I'm going to serve my country and I'm going to fight for freedom. I'm going to fight for my, and more than anything, I'm going to fight for you and you. Like Absolutely. when we all go deploy, <laughs> When you, when you sign up and you join, it's like, yeah, I want to serve my country. I want to, you know, do what's right and be patriotic and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, very good. And then you get in there and it becomes, I don't care about any of these politics. I don't mm -hmm. care about any. I don't know why we're here. I don't care why we're here. But here's what I know. Me and you are going home. Absolutely. It, anything in my power, me and you are going home. And, and so it becomes about the guy to your right and left. And to have somebody that's done that and is so highly valued in our society, uh, to end, to end their own life it's just such a tragedy so we're all and everybody that's listening right now is so glad uh, that you made it through that and, and obviously we're very sorry that you got to that point that's terrible and, and the whole deal with this event is we're trying to raise money to help an organization that prevents this exactly what you, what you went through yeah. it reaches out it actively reaches out to people and, and checks <laughs> It checks on our brothers. It checks on our brothers from the military and the first responders, and, and they reach out to these people and try to make sure that they're taken care of as many of them as possible. Um, 
Now, again, anything we, we, you don't want to go into, you don't want to, okay? But sure. Yeah. No, I'm good, man. I, when just, that, I haven't really talked about it in a while, so yeah, kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. But I'm good. Of course. So when that goes on, and you get to that point in your head, hey, you said it really wasn't military, really, it's more about life circumstances. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the military and just the whole situation, it all kind so of culminated at this one point. So that's know? what I was going to ask. So those life circumstances, mm -hmm. a lot of those were probably created by your time in. Absolutely, yeah. Because that's a very difficult lifestyle for a family. It's difficult on the spouse. It's difficult on the child. And your child, your child is very young. It's difficult on your spouse. And it creates, you know, you're playing Xbox too much. Yeah. I drank a lot. Yeah. When I got back from employment, everybody, some guys go to the gym nonstop. You see these guys in the Marine Corps that look like bodybuilders. Well, they're <laughs> we do these things because you, you get to where you, your mind won't stop. Like that's the biggest thing for me is when you go do these things and you live this constant state of situational awareness, high speed, low drag lifestyle where you're go go go, mission mission mission. Your mind just won't stop, and whether the mission is go shoot the bad guy or the mission is make sure all the aircraft have fuel or the mission is run this mounted patrol even though we don't get shot at your mind is full go all the time and so you get to a place where your mind just won't, won't stop and so we all adopt something to kind of distract us maybe mm -hmm. or keep our mind from slowing down too much and dwelling on certain aspects of what we've done um, or, or just the mental processes and so, 100%, when you come out and you, you have issues in your lifestyle, whether it's, well, you're, you're, doing, you're working too much, you're playing too much Xbox, you're drinking too much, you're, whatever it might be, um, it's connected to, to what you've done. You know, right. That's what causes you to get there in your life. Um, and that's what 22 Kill is all about, is, is about finding those guys that are struggling in any kind of way and doing whatever we got to do to calm their mind down. That, I think that was the biggest adjustment. So as we're talking, and I'm kind of therapy in myself right now, but as we're talking through this, I think the biggest adjustment is getting your mind to calm down and be quiet. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a struggle still. You know. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, it's real. Like, yeah. it still happens for me, too. And I've been out a little bit longer than you have. It, it, it gets better over time, but it never goes away. Like, you never forget that stuff yeah no you really don't man and you you know you see a lot of stuff over there it doesn't matter if you're you know whatever your MOSO is you know is or anything like that it's just if you're going to Afghanistan you're going to see some pretty interesting stuff you know so yeah <laughs> yeah so it's a wild place over there yes it is a wild place um wow man I'm kind of just I'm, I'm still <laughs> trying to process the story you've told because I, I had no idea so um well, I guess, man, is there, is there anything else you want to talk about or anything else you want to say about this deal? Or? Uh, just from my personal experience, man, you know, uh, no one's happier that I, you know, that, that I made it than me because, like I said, man, and that's what I, that's kind of just what I want to share if anybody's ever having that thought, man, because I think, you know, I think we all have those thoughts. I think people that say they don't, I think they probably kid themselves, you know. But, uh, but if anybody's dealing with that, man, it's just, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, isolation. And yeah. that was a big factor in mine. I basically just shut myself down, you know, yeah. from, from everything. I was, it was like, go to the gym, you know, um, come home, drink, you know. Well, that's I, a big factor. kind of rinse and repeat. And like, when, yeah. I, when I actually decided to do this, it was, uh, I think I probably drank more in like a four hour window than I've drank in, you know, in any one day ever. So it was just like, and I've done a lot of drinking, you know, being in the Marine Corps. And so it's not me. Like I've never, you know, believed in suicide. I've always preached against it. And I think that's what it's, what was really scary about it is just like, I know better. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's against, you know, what I believe uh, religiously. It's against, you know, I've, I've done suicide watching the Marine Corps, you know, and be like, what the hell are you doing, you dumb shit, you know? But it's, you know, when you finally get to that point and you've had enough, it, things kind of change, you know? And I think, you know, being inebriated was certainly the, the catalyst because it, it, it would not have been a sober decision that I would have made. You know, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big factor when you do get out, uh, when, you, when you leave that tribal lifestyle. Because in the Marine Corps, it's a total tribal lifestyle. Yeah. And whether it's Army, 
all police, firemen. It's it's what you call a tribal lifestyle where in the Marine Corps we do everything together. Like everything. The guys from your unit, you do everything. They're at your house, you're at their barracks room, whatever. Like on the weekends you're together, you train together, you go to your shop together, like you deploy together, like you live like you eat together. Like you hardly ever eat a meal for four years or however long you're in, if you did one turns four, you hardly ever eat a meal without somebody from your unit with you. It's pretty is it pretty it's pretty rare. Yeah, I mean you rarely at least one person, you know, you're always gonna have that buddy. You so know, it's a it's tribal lifestyle. And then you get out and what did you say? You isolate yourself. You get out, and then you're like, okay, well, they're gone. Like, all these guys that I've, you know, leaned on way more than I realized, and even probably more than you realized at that time you leaned on those guys, now all of a sudden they're they're removed from your life. Not completely. You stayed in contact, but they're not there with you. You're not eating with them. You're not living life with them. And that is a big factor is you feel like it's all on you, and you're all alone. And you're trying to slow your mind down and, and deal with things and, and, and process things. And then life's coming at you, and you got debt, and you got oh, yeah. a, a new child, and you got all these stresses, uh, and it just compounds into where you you do do that 100. percent You go into this little isolated situation, and you feel like there's nobody there. And, and the number one thing that anybody, if there's any military active or former military guys that are struggling with these stuff, they're listening. The number one thing that you got to do, man, you got to talk to somebody. Like, if there's something going on, I know we all are like, nah, we can handle it. Nah, yeah. we can handle it. Man, you've got to talk to somebody. There's organizations like 22 Kill out there. Uh, call me. <laughs> yeah, call somebody. Hit us up on the website. Send me an email. Talk to somebody, okay? Don't make that decision before you talk to somebody. That decision where it's not worth it, I'm all by myself. Uh just please reach out. So don't don't think you're in it alone. Just because you don't have the tribal lifestyle doesn't mean somebody doesn't have your six. You know, the Marine Corps really it, that's you know one of the few negatives about the military, probably any branch, um, is that you know it's they kind of breed that whole asking for help thing out of you. You know, it's yeah, and it you know it's a problem. So I think it's great while you're in, but man, when you get out, you got to get over that crap. It's not it's, well, you never not, have it's to, not tough guy stuff anymore. You know, yeah, it's just real life. So. And you never have to, uh, <clears throat> you really don't have to ask for help while you're in the Marine Corps because you're around people so much that if something's yeah. monkeyed up with you, they're going to know. Like, they'll, they'll ask you before you have to ask anybody if there's something really wrong. Um, and then you get in the civilian world and you don't have that anymore. You don't have that support system. So, Absolutely, man. Reach out. Like, anybody that this thing ever thinks about that, just talk to somebody. Um, well, Anthony, man, I... Uh, I really can't thank you enough for doing this. Absolutely. This is important to get this message out there. This is, I, I've been asked to do a subscriber fishing tournament for a long time. For for a couple of years now, people have been asking for it. Mm -hmm. And I've always been busy, busy, busy. And I always knew that if I did it, I wasn't just going to do a tournament. We were going to do it for a cause that I want to support. And I always knew that would be, of course, a military Outstanding. Uh, cause. So um, I really appreciate you sharing what you shared i had no idea we were actually going to be as on target as we were right so um can't thank you enough brother amen you're welcome and of course, happy to share my man my brother forever sure appreciate it's it nice to meet you too, yes it was good to meet you man yeah. all right you guys drop some comments for anthony let him know let him know how much you appreciate uh him sharing all that dude that's awesome uh man you can hang around if you want to we're just gonna talk fishing the rest of the time no y'all go ahead man uh i'll come i'll come soon Say hi. All right, brother. All right. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Probably the most important thing we've ever done on this channel. One thousand percent. For those y'all listening, those are the kind of people. Yeah. That allow us to have what we have. Yeah. And allow us to go fishing. Allow us to live the freedoms that we live out every single day here in the United States of America. And that is a. Uh, a very in your face very real very raw example of uh, it's not just that they go over there and get shot at and are willing to do it that is kind of the easy part yeah I can see that being the case yeah that's kind of the easy part that, that, that happens a lot in the Marine Corps you're like you go to boot camp people are like, oh boot camp's like so hard Marine Corps boot camp's so hard and yeah it's challenging 
And the funny thing is, is you go through life in the Marine Corps, it's like you look back and boot camp's the easiest thing you did. Yeah. And I can tell you, looking back on it, that the combat deployment is the easiest thing you do. It's it's well, it's not the easiest thing you do, but it's easier because you know what you're going into than dealing with it afterwards. Right. Because at this point, you're prepared to go do what needs to be done. Oh yeah, somebody shoots at me, I got an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you get to the point <coughs> where a lot of guys get, and where you know, unfortunately, Anthony got. You don't have the answer. Obviously, you don't have. It's the only reason they get to that point, they don't have the answer. Right. <clears throat> I mean, I'm trying to hold it together right now. Man, no, I'm with you, man. <laughs> um, <clears throat> guys, that's very. I mean, this is real. This is as real as it gets. I, I don't have. I had no idea that story was going to be told. Um, Y'all show up this week. Yeah, that's the best thing you can do. Y'all show, up, show up this Friday, and we'll have a. I mean, we'll have a great time. We're gonna have an immense amount of fun. There'll be fireworks on the lake Saturday night. You'll hang out with your family, whatever. Um, we'll be hanging around the whole weekend. Um, Cody Cannon's gonna be there from Whiskey Myers. We're gonna have a great time. Um, but y'all show up. Y'all show up for this deal. It's important. So. I don't know what to say about that. So let's transition on the fishing. Uh, I'm sorry this is not flowing very smoothly, and I'm kind of rambling. That that deal, that deal caught me off guard right there. Yeah, that's definitely the big so, self check right there. Yeah, that deal caught me off guard real bad right there. So, so let's talk about fishing, man. Um, current conditions are, are it's summertime. It's hot. Yeah, it's gotten hot again, which is good. It is good. It's the best thing that can happen. We need consistency. <laughs> We, you know, the funny thing was, early in the week we had a cool down. We had like, like a little tropical depression came through, dumped a lot of rain, created cloud cover, dropped the air temperature, and it made the water temps drop dramatically. We actually had the water temps in the 70s. Really? Yeah, water temps actually got down in the 70s. And what's funny is you would go, man, that ought to fire them up, they ought to bite. Nope. Because it's an it's a extreme adjustment for the fish. Exactly, yeah. And it would have fired them up and made them bite real good if it would have stayed that way for an extended period of time. Right. But the deal with fishing is we need consistency. Like constant sort of thing. We can deal with super hot water. We can deal with super cold water. But this up and down makes it really hard because every day is new. You don't have anything okay. to build off of on patterns. Um, it makes it less predictable. Mm -hmm. you, the whole box opens up, so to speak, versus you know eliminating a lot of the water for you when the, when it's always hot. You know when it's always hot, they're only going to be doing a couple things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm glad it's hot again. The fish are starting to bite a little better at the end of the week. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm, no, strug I'm, I'm sorry. I'm struggling to process everything right now. Um, but, yeah, the offshore bite's getting better. Uh, some of that shallow grass bite around that deeper grass edges is getting better. Um, and we should be set up now for, you know, I keep saying this, but we should be set up now where we kind of stay in that more consistent summertime pattern. Um, the dragging baits really seem to be working better offshore. Carolina rig, shaky heads. Um, that's really kind of been the two baits that I've been leaning on offshore. Um, of shallow, it's, it's, it's chatter baits and little swim baits and frogs a little bit, you know. I have caught some frog fish lately. And, and then weightless plastics. Yeah. I'm ready to throw the big shaky head. I'll tell you something else I've been throwing is that grass spoon. That flutter spoon that's that smaller flutter spoon mm -hmm. with a single hook. I've been, I've been catching a few on that grass spoon, uh, which is a very unique deal. Um, I get around deeper grass edges where it scatters, and I take a flutter spoon that's got a single hook on it. It's a smaller spoon. Mm -hmm. And I throw it out there, and then I rip it out of the grass like you rip a trap. Right. And then it's... It's just a different bait than those fish in the grass ever see. Nobody's really going into that grass throwing a flutter spoon. Very much a big time reaction bite. My personal best actually came at the end of June, or no, the end of May. It's either the end of May or early June. Summertime bite. Mm -hmm. On that grass flutter spoon. My, my biggest fish that I've ever personally caught came out of that. So. And I can't imagine they just come out of the grass and just thump that thing, huh? Oh, they do. They knock uh, the fire out of it. I bet they knock slack in that thing. <laughs> hey, dude, you don't, it's not a mushy bite. No. Nah. It's not a mushy bite. No, nah, it's just like, so. you know, I think of a similar deal like punching. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, Like yeah, when yeah. they, when yeah. they, bam. Yeah. It's go time, baby. And a lot of times that spoon falls on a slack line and you, like, literally see your whole line jump. Yeah. You know? So oh, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a good lot time. Of fun. <laughs> uh, 
So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the fishing report is we, we are settling in the summertime patterns. Dragon baits are better offshore. Uh, moving baits and, you know, swim bait, cheddar bait, weightless plastic in the grass. And then if you want to do something outside the box, play around with that flutter spin in the grass deal. Put a single hook on there instead of a treble and rip it out of that grass. So. I, one thing I did want to touch on, okay, because I've seen a lot of people doing this lately. When you're throwing a big football jig, yeah. you know, offshore structure, yeah. I see people, when they're, when they're stroking it, they're doing it when their line's tight. Can you kind of go through how you're supposed to do you that? Mean like they're not snapping slack. Right. right. There's there's snapping. I don't snap, no, I don't snap slack whenever uh, well it depends how high you're trying to keep the jig too, right? So right. that may be a situation where they're never letting the jig fall away the bottom. They're trying to keep it up in the water column on mm -hmm. suspended fish. Right. And that's a really tough deal to get right. You gotta be pretty sharp and pretty skilled and have a lot of knowledge of your fall rate and all that stuff to keep that jig in the right depth. Okay. So like the way I've always done it, which works for me the best. Yeah. which I played around with that football jig for a long time before I finally learned how to actually do it, yeah. is I'll pop, 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 and just kind of dragging it as I'm yeah. popping it. And then when, once I get to 12 o'clock, then I'll reach down and pop, pop okay. on slack, just so I can get that little hop. Well, that's, yeah, that's different. Um, I mean, no, as far as when I'm trying to actually stroke a jig, now I'll do little hops and stuff like that when I'm dragging a jig sometimes. But as far as actually stroking a jig way up off the bottom, I'm gonna let it fall to the bottom, and then I'm gonna reel my line down. And I'm gonna get my line tight at the bottom, and I'm gonna, whack, whack. I mean, I'm gonna pull it from the bottom to the top twice, and I'm gonna snap it as hard as I can. I want it to. My deal is when I when that jig takes off, I want it to shoot off the bottom as fast as possible to create again that reaction bite. Right. So I'm gonna go wham, wham, and then I'm gonna let it. And then when it starts falling, I'm gonna kind of hold my rod up and follow and my line follow down. It down. Yes. I want it to be slack, but I don't want it to be too much slack. Like I want to feel the bite if they hit it. So I'm gonna kind of follow it down. It gets to the bottom, reel up my sack again, bam, bam. Right. Now, so I do it all the way to the bottom and up. If fish are suspended high, I don't really use a jig. I think there's right. other baits that are better. I mean, a flutter spoon's better. I think a swim bait on a jig head's better. We talked about that a lot in the last seminar, last mm -hmm. couple of seminar episodes. Um, I, that Magnum Impact Shad, that 7-inch Impact Shad fluke style bait on a like 6 7 knot weightless EWG hook, that's a really good bait for fish that are suspended really high. I think all those are more effective, so I really don't use a jig for fish that are suspended high, but if they're suspending three, four, five, six feet off the bottom, sometimes stroking that jig is the way to do it. And it works really well. Like, it gets a big bite. I guess I guess what I'm, <clears throat> I don't know, I guess a lot of what I see is they'll be doing that drag deal like I do, and then they'll reel it down and pull it. I mean, you're, I'm talking about pulling it several feet off. Oh the, yeah, no, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to pull it five, six feet up off the bottom. <laughs> Like, I'm getting my line tied at the bottom and jerking it as high as I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm with you on the height deal. Yeah. But I guess when you're fishing like a hump or something like that and your margin of error is so small for that sweet spot. Right. I, I guess I kind of want to keep it on top as much as I can and get little hops. Well, you, and you got to think about it like this. When you're stroking that jig and it's shooting up and it's creating a reaction, they'll, they're going to shoot over to it. <clears throat> True. So you don't have to be right on the spot within the spot because that's a bait that was any react to. They're going to jump out and come at it. So. Right. So. But yeah, I mean, and that may be a deal where if you're fishing the wrong spot, you can't do it like that. Right. Right. So that, that'd be an adjustment you have to make in the moment. So, uh, man, it's been some tournament fishing stuff going on. So there, has. W there was one of the FLW <laughs> super tournaments <laughs> that had, you know, some of the MLF guys join the field mm -hmm. and lo and behold, <clears throat> Jacob Wheeler. Jake, well, they were on first. Well, first, they were on Chickamauga, right? So anytime all the pros line up on Chickamauga, Jacob Wheeler, like that's his, that's his spot, dude. He lives there now, but even before he lived there, it's like he's won so much on Chickamauga, like that's his place. He owns that lake. Yeah, he beat uh, second place by twelve pounds. He beat second place by twelve pounds, folks. You know, wow. So is Jacob Wheeler the best angler on planet Earth? Yes. Now? I would say yes. I would say yes. But I would say the reemergence of Jordan Lee with his recent win at the heavy hitters makes it a much – like there's an argument now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that I disagree that Wheeler is the best. I do think Wheeler is the best. It's just not by nearly as much of a margin as I thought it was before Jay Lee won that heavy hitters. Because Jay Lee had kind of not disappeared. He just hadn't won in a while. Right. He had that run, you know, he won two classics and he won the first MLF Bass Pro Tour tournament. And everybody was like, Jake, uh, Jordan Lee's the best angler. And we were all saying it. Oh, yeah. We were on board uh, that Jordan Lee's the best angler in the world. And then he kind of, not that he didn't do anything, he just didn't win. Right. And Jacob Wheeler started winning everything. 
everything. So then it became, well, Jacob Wheeler's the best guy, and it's you know for sure the best guy. Well, now we've kind of got. Here's what's the best thing for bass fishing. It's kind of like we talked about it a couple weeks ago. How it's good for bass fishing that bass and MLF have this rivalry because it's making each of them step up and do better things. How great is it as a bass fishing fan to have two guys as young as Jordan Lee and Jacob Wheeler? They're the best in the world. How many years are we going to get to watch these two guys? It's going to be like a Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods, or oh, yeah, Jack sure. Nicholas, Arnold Palmer deal. And I'm using golf because it's an individual sport like fishing is. But, I mean, we've got – these two guys are going to throw darts at each other for a long time, and it's going to be real fun to watch. Oh, dude. I, <clears throat> this is the best time that I can think of in the history of me being a bass fisherman to be a fan of the sport. This is probably this probably is the best time. You know what's funny is there's been so much uh, disruption and so much negative connotation put out there by a lot of people about how terrible the split was and blah 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 between MLF and Bass and the anglers leaving and moving around. I think everybody was wrong. Like it's the opposite. It's not bad. It's the best thing that's ever happened to tournament fishing. And I do think this is the best time to be a bass fishing fan in the history of the sport because there's more and better way better coverage there's more high level tour events there's better coverage the guys are all making more money than they used to they're all working on a better deal than they used to as far as their payouts go um and we've got some young talent that is just i mean the talent pool in bass fishing now is so deep and then to have two young likable guys it's not like it's Tommy Biffle. Right, yeah. And in some instances, Kevin Van Dam. Kevin Van Dam can be a little off-putting at times. Now, I know Kevin Van Dam's great. He's a great man. He does a lot of things. You know, he's a great man. I'm not knocking Kevin Dam. But there's times when you watch Kevin Van Dam where he gets kind of hard to root for because he can kind of – he gets so locked in he can kind of be a jerk. Yeah. Um, in which that's his competitive nature. I get it. But – He's way nicer than I would be in that situation. Like, <laughs> That's I, what I'm saying. Like, I don't know how you I would handle that. I would be. You talk about an unlikable guy. You <laughs> let me get out there and compete against the best in the world and actually have a chance to win. I'll be real unlikable, bro. Yeah. Real no, unlikable. I'm so, not knocking Kevin, but, man, Jacob Wheeler and Jordan Lee are two of the more likable guys. They're easy going. Uh, they're great with, with crowd. They're great with interactions on the water. They're great on camera. Mm-hmm. Man, we are just... I mean, we are sitting in the catbird seat as bass fishing fans uh, for the foreseeable future right now. Hey, I'm going to throw another name out there for you. Guess who also top 10th? Who's that? John Cox. Well, yeah. He, uh, of course he Well, did. yeah. <laughs> Does he ever not? Golly, that did. That's another guy that... <clears throat> I'm saying, if there was an argument for another If angler, he gets on the Bass Pro Tour... And does what he's been doing, you can put him right in that. You can put a third in the argument for best in the world. Correct. My problem with giving John Cox a nod to put him in that discussion is he hasn't done it against the very best yet. Yet. Right. You're right. I'm with you. He just hasn't lined up and, and played with the best. That's right. I, I think he will. I think he will too. I think and he sees the right on the wall. I think sure. he will, and I think when he does, I think he'll do the same thing he's been doing. I think oh, he's, he's going to some heads. Yeah. I think he's that good. I think he is as good as almost anybody um, but when you're talking about okay who's the best man there's some skins on the wall that you gotta pay attention to oh yeah right mm-hmm. and Jacob Wheeler and Jordan Lee have over the last several years have definitely put the most skins on the wall the biggest most skins on the wall Wheeler's hey, smallest bag was 21 pounds <laughs> yeah he killed him dude <laughs> crushed him so in summer you know mm-hmm. the fish don't weigh near as much right now as they weigh earlier in the year right or later in the year they're yeah. at their lowest weights uh, Still caught 93 pounds of bass. In yeah, four he days. killed it, dude. Killed it. Crazy. Killed it. Um, yeah, he's unbelievable. Now, you had a tournament I since did. the last time we talked. I did. I'm talking. So, talk, talk to me, Goose. So, uh, man, that is probably the weirdest lake I've ever fished in my entire is life. It? It I've is. never fished it. Dude, so. it's weird. Oh, it's right up your alley, bro. I know. That's what I've heard. It so is. Talk to me. Tell so, me it. it was hot as all get out. I couldn't see, we couldn't see our lures for the first 35, 40 minutes of fishing because first cast was at 5.30. Oh, wow, okay. And so last cast was at 1 o'clock, me and line by 1.45 to wake. Uh, my partner had been on the lake one time prior and fished one little area, and he said, hey, this is the area. We're you fished with Cam? I did fish with Cam. Yeah. And, um, you know, mainly what he was wanting to do was get out there and we had a lanes chip and just kind of get some lanes because it's a... It's a pretty hairy lake, yeah, being gotta, so shallow and all that. you got to know how to run it. Correct. Yeah. 
And so it was ba- mainly a navigation, just kind of see the layout. Whatnot. Shout out to Tom Main making uh, Tom Lane's done a lot as far as mm-hmm. helping with some East Texas navigation on Lake Palestine and now Lake Tawaki as well. Mm-hmm. Tom Lane actually sells a map ship that you can put into your electronics units and it'll put trails on there for you to run safely. Yep, and you can go. You can just go to his Facebook page or his website, Tom Main Fishing. Yep, and you can order those. He makes them for Lawrence, Hummingbird, Garnet. This is not a sponsored plug. No. I'm but just, Tom Main, we are accepting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's a great chip. I mean, I got one for Palestine. Yeah, it's, he did a good so. job. He did a good job. <clears throat> so, um, anyways, we show up to the ramp day of the tournament, and Cam says, "You know, I'd been on Navionics doing some map study and stuff right. like that. Google Earth, yeah, go you back did some homework, yep. yeah." And uh, I'm just, you know, being a bass fishing guy, and just knowing what time of year it is, I'm looking for stuff offshore, right. Just because that's what you're technically, sure. you know, whatever. Well, we launch a boat, which we have boat trouble at, at first. Of which, course you did. Well, when we did that, like when that happened, I looked at the camera and I said, you know, that's exactly what we needed, right? Because every time we have boat trouble, we get the money. <laughs> I ain't kidding you. That's great. And so uh, we get to our first spot, which ended up being the only spot we fished all day. And uh, we're literally casting in two foot or less all day long, yeah. dead of summer right like okay we caught a lot of fish you know probably 20 plus in the boat yeah we had five keeper bites all day oh wow ended up getting second place well that's good caught a five something with literally minutes to spare last which minute our, which was our fourth fish and you only, oh it was your fourth mm-hmm. and then our fifth fish i ended up catching last cast was at one i think i caught it at twelve forty seven. or something oh, wow. like that yeah, Y'all had some last minute heroics yeah. to fill it's the bag a, out. Yeah, it's just a it's a weird lake, man. But it was a good time. I, How I did mean, y'all catch them up, Shallow? Uh, we were throwing quarter ounce uh, brush hogs. Take, take, take just flip, pitch just, and flip. Them. And nice. so they've got this grass out there, and I don't know what it's called. I've done some research, and I think it's called pepper grass. Yeah, it's like a Florida native yep. type grass. And real stringy, real stringy, Thin real strings. stemmy. Yeah, yeah, that's pepper grass. Yep. And so, there's there's little pockets of it on forking places. Is there? Yes. Well, it's some weird grass. It and is. they were hunkered up in that stuff. Like, it, it was the weirdest thing. Like, I remember one fish that came and put in the box. I think it was like the first fish. He flips up in there, and this bait no sooner hits the water, and you see a freaking swirl. Oh, And wow. he's like, uh, grab the net. And for those of you who ain't never fished in this grass, getting them out of this stuff is not easy. Yeah, because it wads up real bad. Yes. It's real limp, stem, stringy grass. It wads up on everything. Yes, and so it was a... Uh, Fishing, it's kind of a pain because it gets, It was, it was yeah, tough. Yeah. Because we were throwing up in it, and, you know, I remember making several casts that morning going, man, if I hook up here, we're going to have a situation. Right, right. And so, no, but you got to get them on before you get them off, bro. Hey, man. Hey, you know what we, I mean? We caught a lot of fish. It was a good time. That's good. So, you see, you in second place, man. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. Good job to you. I bet it feels good to come on here and not talk about how bad you sucked for once. Yeah. Because yeah, it seems like every time we've talked about one of your tournaments, it hadn't been great. Yeah. You know, we, we have bad days. We do. Yeah. We're fishermen. <laughs> we all do. We yeah. all do. That's for sure, man. So, uh, hey, side note, guess who's getting a haircut on Friday? Hey, yo. You remember that? Yeah. And we got to do it. You got an outfit, and we've got to uh, put some lightning bolts That's right. in there. Some lightning bolts. And we're going to put pink spike it in the lightning bolts to make them show a lot better. Mm-hmm. I was going to go with I don't know if that highlighter. was actually part of the agreement, but we're going to put some type of coloring on your lightning <laughs> bolts <laughs> Yeah, yeah. to it's make gonna, them stick out. It's going to be a good So time. definitely come to this tournament. Not only can you support a good cause, but you can see this guy look like an absolute idiot. It's going to be great. <laughs> and this is the punishment because you lost our... Yep. Our bets on our little fantasy drafts that we did. Mm-hmm. We need to do. We need to come up with another fantasy draft. We do. I enjoyed those. Yeah, those are fun. Uh, y'all sure. drop in the comments. Give us some ideas. What kind of fishing-related fantasy draft should we do, or just whatever y'all want to see? Really, what type of fantasy draft should we do so that I can beat Chris again? How much do you want to bet? At some point Friday night, there ends up being a flipping contest. Ah, I'm not gonna bet against it. Because I know it's going to happen. It's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Those are so much fun. For sure. There's going to be. That is kind of me and Chris's deal. Anytime we That'd get together like a in a fishing world environment and we're staying somewhere overnight, we always end up in a flipping contest. The old guides tournaments, it's, like, it's just so vivid in my mind. Yeah. It'd be 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Oh, yeah. And we'd be out there oh, those flipping were, on Those were throwdowns, paper man. plate. Yep. Those, before those guide tournaments, we always, and after, boy, after. Yeah. Those were always a good time, no doubt, man. There was a, 
There were some stories that we there were some stories that happened after God's sermon that we definitely cannot ever tell ever on the podcast in the history of ever. <laughs> no, probably just can't ever tell them. Period. Yeah, <laughs> just keep it to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, those are best untold. But no, I'm really I, I'm really looking forward to this weekend. Uh, yeah. Like you said, dude, this is this is something that is definitely uh, yeah. This is one of the best things we've ever never done. Yeah, it's the best thing we've ever done. Um, tonight was the most important conversation we've ever had on the channel, and doing what we're doing, and, and hopefully raising a bunch of money. Uh, which you guys, it's going to be you guys that raise the money. You know, really, all you that are listening, it'll be the best thing this channel's ever done. Yep. Um, all, other than it. maybe some of the the faith stuff that we've done with Dennis and everything else, you know, right. when we've talked about our faith and reached out for God. Other than that, this this will be the best thing we've ever done. So, y'all come show some support. It's the most yeah. Iffy. Please do. Please do. The times we're living in, this is the best thing we can do for our fellow man right here. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think we've kind of went full circle. I don't, I don't really see any reason to talk any further. Um, I'm really glad that Anthony came over here to do that tonight. I'm really appreciative of him for doing that. And again, I had no idea where it was going to go and how on target it was going to be. Um, it's really awesome of him to tell that story with us, to share it, because he didn't have to tell us that. That wasn't what I was bringing him over here to even talk about. Right. I didn't even know that was a thing. So uh, that was really great of him to open up and talk about that on a public forum like this. Uh, can't thank him enough for that. So. Great job, Anthony. Yep. All right, man, we're going to wrap it up, guys. Hey, y'all, please come join us this week. I know we've said it many times, but please come join us. We want to do this big. Guys like Anthony, uh, and he's good now, you know, but we all still have our struggles. But a lot of stories, like you heard tonight, go on. In fact, to the number of 22 a day. 22 veterans every day commit suicide. And that's why the organization 22 Kill exists. That's the meaning of their name. Uh, we need to make that number go way the hell down. Way down. Yeah. Let's do so. Let's help that. Let's try to make that number go down this weekend. Y'all come join us. Thank y'all so much for listening to tonight's podcast. I uh, sure hope you enjoyed it. Hey, Chris, do that thing you do. See y'all this weekend. <laughs>